I can sit back a little bit, relax, I'm good. I'm a good Christian. <laughs> I'm mature. I'm better than, uh-oh. Well, at least I'm not like, I only miss three Sundays a year. So? Don't miss any Sundays, but I'm just saying so. That's not the goal. The goal is to be like Christ. The goal is to experience him more and more and more each day. And I didn't say this the first message, but I just feel like saying that today. Maybe one of the problems is that you're hanging around people that have no ambition for more of God. When you're in an environment, I find sometimes the most toxic people are not unbelievers, but believers. Comfortable believers. Satisfied believers. Provided for believers. Prosperous believers. It, you know you need to get around some desperate believers. I'll tell you this. Sometimes the people who inspire me in prayer the most are people that just got saved. Because they may not necessarily know all the fancy things today. Say, oh, Yahweh, creator of the universe. Jehovah Jireh, my provider. Jehovah Rapha, my healer. I don't know all that. But God, I need you. I've seen you change my life, and God, I'm in a place of desperation. And God, I, I don't know if I'm coming to you correct, God. I don't mean any disrespect, but God, I just want to say I need you. There's a desperation, a, a hunger. And I'll tell you, as a pastor who's been saved for a long time, I'm challenged. I begin to say, where's my desperation? Where's my hunger? Where is my God? I need you like I have never needed you before. And I'm telling you, when that zeal stirs up, the Holy Spirit comes sweeping in, and he begins to take us to levels that we never thought possible. Look at the person next to you, tell him there's so much more he has for you. Look at somebody else, tell him, don't settle. <laughs> because if you do, you can't sit next to me. Second thing I want you to write down is this. I'm just not the same, so I don't act the same. So I don't act the same. Matthew chapter 4, verse 20, it says this. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two brothers, James the son of Zebedee. How would you like if your dad's name was Zebedee? Isn't your dad? Yeah, yeah, I know. Be quiet. <laughs> and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, many in their nets, he called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. When I first read this over and I've read this story maybe hundreds of times, I was amazed at their faith. Here it is, you just met Jesus for the first time and you just drop everything and just follow him. I mean, that, that, that's kind of crazy. <laughs> I mean, I know that you dropped your net and he brought in a huge catch, but I mean, that, that's a lot of faith. Not only did I go back, not only until I went back and read and realized this is not the first time James, John, Andrew, and Peter met Jesus. In fact, they had seen Jesus baptized by John the Baptist. They had had different encounters with Jesus. And actually, a few days before, Jesus had eaten dinner at Peter's house. The Bible says that Jesus went to Peter's house and Peter's mother-in-law was sick, that she had a fever, and they asked Jesus to heal the mother-in-law. Jesus prayed for the mother-in-law, and it says instantly the fever broke, and she went in the kitchen and made beef stew and rice, and Jesus was happy. At least that's what my translation said. But they had seen Jesus move and work and interact different times. And then this day, Jesus came to them and he said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Now, in our context, in our culture, that just means, hey, come on, hang out with me, and I'm going to, you know, work with you, and we'll work through this, and we'll, we'll get to where we're going. But in their context, this would have been as good as if a contract had been signed. 
When Jesus said, follow me, what he was really saying was, will you come and be my apprentice, and I will teach you, I will train you to be like me. You know there were not colleges and universities in that time. It was all based on apprenticeship. If you wanted to be a physician, a, a seamstress, a blacksmith, a goldsmith, you would find someone and ask them, will you allow me to follow you? When Jesus asked the disciples to follow him, it was as if they were making a contract. You will do what I do and become like me. I find sometimes when people give their life to Christ, they ask him to be their Lord and Savior. That they may not realize I'm signing a contract with Jesus. That I will be like him. I am giving up my control of my life, and I am going to do what he does. I'm going to mimic what he's doing. Does the Holy Spirit transform our lives? Yes. But as he transforms our lives, he expects us to conform ourselves to the image of God. In Galatians chapter 5, I believe verse 24, it says this, that we must crucify our flesh with its passions and sinful natures. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes, I'm putting myself all the way on blast. And you guys might be a little uncertain about your pastor after his message, but you'll be okay. Sometimes I find myself saying, I'm just waiting for the Holy Spirit to change me. And the Holy Spirit is saying, it's clearly written in my word. I'm waiting for you to stop disobeying me. I don't really feel led <laughs> to do that. Let me help you out with something. If it's written in the word, you don't need to be led. <laughs> All the lead you need is right there in black and white. I'm waiting for the spirit to move on my heart to forgive someone. You don't need to wait for the spirit <laughs> to move on your heart to forgive someone. The spirit moved on the heart of the writer of the book of Matthew that says, if you don't forgive others, God can't forgive you. That's all the spirit moving you need. Sometimes we wait for the Holy Spirit to do what God has given us power to do. The Holy Spirit gives us power to control our flesh, to make our own decisions, but we must make our own decisions. You know, a lot of times I find that one of the greatest inhibitors of us growing in Christ is we are not conscientious about what God is asking us to do when he's asking us to do it. Let, let me ask you this. When's the last command that God has given you that you didn't like? Think about it. Think about it. Think about it. What's the last command? He, he didn't ask you. He didn't say, hey, let's talk about this. Do you think we should do this? No. He said, I command you to forgive that person. What's the last thing that he said, this is what you must do? Did you do it? Because you may not realize, but when we obey, open ourselves up for more of God. But when we disobey, we actually cut ourselves off from all that God has for us. 1 John chapter 5, verse 2, it says this. But this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is love. This is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. In other words, obeying God is not a problem. Anybody, you don't have to raise your hand. You can just look straight ahead because I'm not talking about you. Anybody, you read something in the Bible you just didn't like? <laughs> you just didn't agree with? You hear me say this all the time, that dumb verse about putting other people's desires above my own. <laughs> Let your mind be the same mind of Christ. Humble your snow of all that. Sometimes we look at Jesus' commands as a burden. Oh, goodness, God. I have, sometimes we think obeying God is actually keeping us back. You see, God, you don't understand. Coming to church is actually inhibiting me. There's so much I could be doing right now. There's so much money I could be making. Why in the world did you command me not to forsake the assemblies of the brethren? It's such a burden. Not understanding that every time we obey God, 
there's a new experience with God. There's a new encounter with God on the other side. You know, sometimes we think about our disobedience as no big deal, not realizing our disobedience is hindering the next thing that God wants to reveal to us in our lives. There's so much more that God has for us. And sometimes it's just the most simple step of obedience that opens that to us. In Romans chapter 11, verse 33, it says this, Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. In other words, Paul was saying there is so much that God has for you, so much wisdom, so much knowledge. Now, you don't have to say it out loud, but just think about it. How many verses? This might take some of you a long time, might take some of you about half a second. How many verses can you just rattle off the top of your head? I, I don't even have to turn there. I don't even look. I know it. Let's see. Jesus wept. <laughs> Got that one. Um, what's that other one? For God so loved the world that he forgave his <laughs> Whosoever believe in him shall not perish and have eternal life. I know that one. Um, now I lay me down to sleep. I no, no, not that one. <laughs> But a lot of times when we think about the knowledge of God, we think about how much scripture do I know? How much of Jesus can I tell somebody else about? How much can I recite? How much do I have in my repertoire? This word knowledge is actually not the knowledge that we think of in terms of intellectual knowledge. It's the word gnosko, which in the Greek is their word for intimacy. What it's actually saying is, how much of God have you had an intimate encounter with? The Bible says in John chapter 1 that the word became flesh and walked among us. In other words, what we see in here at some point we should see in our lives. So I have a different question to ask you. Not how much Bible do you have memorized, but how much Bible have you experienced? Where in your life can you point to and say, this is where that verse is right there. He said, cast all my cares upon him, for he cares for me. And I remember that time when I was overwhelmed, and I just laid my word on him. And it was like the peace of God began to guard my heart, began to guard my mind. It's not just a good verse. I've seen it come to pass in my life. 